purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky seek recognition? Madam Speaker, pursuant to the rule, I call up the joint resolution H.J. Res. 44 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the title of the joint resolution. House Joint Resolution 44. Joint resolution making further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2011 and for other purposes. Pursuant to House Resolution 115, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Dix, will each control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, the House is not in order. Gentleman's correct. The House is not in order. The House will be in order. Members and staff are advised to take their conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. Gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. I rise today in support of H.J. Res. 44, the Fiscal 2011 Further Continuing Appropriations Resolution. This temporary CR is an extra special effort by the majority Republicans to avoid a government shutdown that could otherwise occur on March 4th when the current funding resolution expires. This temporary CR contains funding to allow all government agencies and programs to continue at the current rate of spending for the next two weeks until March 18, 2011 while reducing spending by $4 billion through several spending cuts and program terminations. These cuts reflect this Republican majority's continued commitment to significantly reduce spending, rein in the nation's exploding deficits and debt, and to help our economy continue on the road to recovery. Madam Speaker, a government shutdown would halt critical and necessary services and programs that Americans across the country rely on and is not what our constituents expect or demand. I would have greatly preferred that the Senate act on the hard-fought and thoughtfully crafted funding legislation that the House passed. Gentlemen, is correct. The House is not in order. The House will be in order. Members and staff are advised to take their conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. Gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, the House is not in order. The House will be in order. Members and staff are advised to take their conversations off the floor. The House will be in order. The gentleman from Kentucky. I would have greatly preferred that the Senate act on the hard-fought and thoughtfully crafted funding legislation that the House passed almost two weeks ago, which saves the taxpayers $100 billion compared to the President's request. But it's clear that the Senate needs more time. So this short-term CR will provide an additional two weeks while cutting spending to show our continued resolve to get our nation's fiscal house in order. The bill before us terminates eight programs for a savings of about $1.24 billion. These eight programs were all targeted for elimination uh, in the President's budget request have also been part of proposed cuts in the past in the House and the Senate by members of both parties. These eight programs include election assistance grants, the broadband direct loan subsidy, the Smithsonian Institution Legacy Fund, the Striving Readers Program, the LEAP Program, even, uh, even START, smaller learning communities, and a one-time highway funding addition. In addition, the bill also uh, eliminates more than $2.7 billion in uh, funding previously reserved for earmarks, eliminations that the House, the Senate, and the White House have all called for this year. 
The earmarked funding cuts in this legislation come from energy and water, homeland security, labor, health, and human services, legislative branch, and transportation, housing, and urban development program accounts. This legislation will represent the second of many appropriations bills this year that will significantly reduce spending, continuing a pattern of cuts that will help put our nation's budget back in balance and stop the dangerous spiral of unsustainable deficits and debt. It is my hope that this CR can be passed quickly and that the President will sign it before the March 4th deadline. This legislation should garner broad support today, given the short time frame for action and given the fact that these spending cuts have received previous bipartisan support by members of the House and Senate, as well as the White House. Madam Speaker, we're now five months into the current fiscal year, and it's critically important that we complete this budget process so that we can turn our attention quickly to passing funding bills for fiscal year 2012. It's high time we start looking forward instead of constantly looking back to clean up past mistakes and inaction. We must move forward quickly, in regular order, passing bills on time, in an open and transparent fashion, to avoid these budget uncertainties in the future. Madam Speaker, this is one more step that we have to take to get our fiscal house in order. While this isn't a perfect or an easy process, it is essential that we pass this bill avoid a government shutdown, and continue work on long-term solution to complete this long overdue funding process. Our constituents expect and deserve no less. I reserve my balance. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield myself as much time as I need. Gentleman from Washington is recognized. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, today we will consider a short-term continuing resolution that will allow the essential functions of our government to continue beyond March 4th, the date on which the current continuing resolution will expire. With no final agreement on the spending levels for the current fiscal year, this measure is necessary in order to avoid a government shutdown, something I believe we should all want to do. I think that two weeks is not enough time to reach an agreement on H.R. 1 with the other body. And I, I, I'm afraid we're going to be back here uh, doing this again. Now, when the House approved H.R. 1 earlier this month, despite the overwhelming opposition of the Democratic caucus, it was clear to me that gaining agreement on a compromised version of a full year continuing resolution would be very difficult, at least before the expiration of the current CR. We opposed H.R. 1 because we believe it would have the effect of slamming on the fiscal brakes too abrupt, abruptly, resulting in higher unemployment and threatening our nation's economic recovery. There is no dispute that cutting federal spending too deeply and too quickly before the economy has fully recovered risks slowing growth and losing jobs. Moody's estimates that H.R. 1 would reduce real growth in 2011 by 0.5 percent, meaning 400,000 fewer jobs in 2011 and 700,000 fewer jobs by the end of 2012. The Economic Policy Institute pro projected job losses near 800,000. Goldman Sachs predicts that H.R. 1 would slow economic growth by about between 1.5 and 2 percentage points which translates into an, the American economy losing up to 2.4 million jobs. So the recovery of our economy and the reduction of unemployment should be our paramount concern at this time. I said that dur during the debate on H01 earlier this month, and I will repeat today, that I believe the approach to deficit reduction that has been adopted by the Republican majority here in the House is far too narrow and too focused on the smallest segment of spending in the budget. It is risky, a risky strategy based on the specious concept of cut and grow, 
which of course has no basis in sound economic theory. So what does, where does this leave us? We are now six months into the current fiscal year, FY 11, and hearings with regard to the fiscal year 2012 budget have begun in both the Budget Committee and the Appropriations Committee. H.R. 1 is clearly not acceptable to the other body, nor would it be acceptable to the President, whose signature is necessary before any funding bill can become law. What the President has already proposed for the coming year, a budget freeze at last year's level, remains in my judgment the best and most effective way to reduce the deficit and to support recovery in major sectors of our economy. And in fact, we have already adopted a freeze at FY10 levels in the continuing resolution that we are currently operating under. Democrats approved the CR in December with only one Republican vote, which represents a reduction. Now, I want you all to listen to this of $41 billion from the level sought by the President in his FY 2011 budget request, a significant reduction in the deficit, and a significant part of that came from defense. I want to repeat this. The $41 billion cut from the Obama FY 11 budget was passed in a CR by the Democratic House and Democratic Senate and signed into law by the Democratic president with only one Republican vote. We are now on the verge of an expiring CR, and we are considering another version that extends the time to resolve the differences by only two weeks. I take the chairman at his word that neither he nor the leadership is interested in shutting down the operation of the federal government by declaring a statement in these appropriations deliberations. Uh, I will concede that it is disconcerting to me and others on our side to read the Speaker's comments this week that would seem to imply that there is a strategy of passing shorter-term appropriation bills further and further and further cuts, I mean, two weeks at a time. We were concerned by his statement that seemed to indicate a plan for a piecemeal approach to future spending cuts. He said, and I quote, if they won't eat the whole loaf at one time, we'll make, the, make them eat it one slice at a time. I believe we need to set aside these political machinations and get serious about finishing up work on the fiscal year 2011 budget. And I will be the first to admit that it's because we didn't pass, the Democrats didn't pass our bills last year that we're here working on this. So we have responsibility too, and that's one of the reasons why we were so eager to engage Chairman Rogers in trying to get this open rule, work through the amendments, get a, get a continuing uh, resolution, I mean a uh, unanimous consent agreement, and uh, to help move this process, because I personally feel we have some responsibility here. And I think it is obvious that we are going to need more than, as I said, I'll say this and I started, and I'll say it again, the two weeks to get from here to there. Now, I appreciate the desire of the gentleman from Kentucky to encourage the members of his caucus to enter into serious negotiations with the other body with the hope of completing work by March 18th. But in a conference, I've been in conferences for 34 years and eight years before that as a staffer, nobody gets everything they want. It's a process of compromise. You work out the differences between the two positions. But I will, I'm proud of the fact that we start with a cut of $41 billion that was enacted by the Democratic Congress in December, a very successful lame duck session. I, yield back, I re reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Kentucky. You don't have 30 seconds. The gentleman's recognized. The, the gentleman who's my friend uh, mentioned uh, the economists uh, and, and their opinion of H.R. 1, the, the budget cutting bill we passed a couple of weeks ago. The, the, the best, the best uh, source that I think of right off is Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Reserve, who has said H.R. 1 would have no negligible impact, harmful impact on the economy. And if the chairman of the Federal Reserve says that, I tend to believe him. Now I yield three minutes to the chairman of the Energy and Water Subcommittee on our committee, 
The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Freeling Heisen. Thank you, Chairman, for yielding. The gentleman yielding. from New Jersey is recognized for three minutes. Uh, Madam uh, Chairwoman, I rise in support of this continuing resolution. It's reasonable and a thoughtful path forward to avoid a potential government shutdown. Mr. Speaker, the American people have made two things perfectly clear. First, they want their government to stay up and running. And secondly, they want us to cut spending. We need to do both. Like many of us, I would have greatly preferred that the Senate Act on H.R. 1, the seventh month continuing resolution that we debated for over 90 hours. That included, indeed, the largest spending reductions in the history of, the, of any Congress. Ten days ago, this committee in the House took the President's budget and cut it, over, cut it by over $100 billion, terminating dozens of government programs in the process. And in a city where President Reagan once said, and I quote, a government bureau is the nearest thing to an inter eternal life that we'll ever see on this earth, end quote, that's quite an accomplishment. Mr. Speaker, the resolution we have before us today is a simple stopgap measure to provide more time for negotiations to develop a funding bill for the rest of the current fiscal year. It's temporary and it must pass to keep the government open beyond, Feb uh, beyond Friday. This bill contains $4 billion in savings, including just under a billion from programs under the jurisdiction of my committee, Energy and Water Development. These savings are found purely from eliminating earmarks inserted by Congress in the fiscal year 2010 bill. As with other spending reductions in this temporary bill, the committee has taken great pains to include only savings that both parties and both chambers support. Both the House and Senate have sworn off earmarks for fiscal year 2011, so these reductions should not be controversial. Mr. Colleagues, my colleagues, we must move this resolution. We need it to provide time to continue negotiations to complete the important work that should have been done by the last Congress, which passed no appropriations bills. Mr. Speaker, I repeat, the American people have made it clear they want their government to stay open for business. They also want us to cut spending. Let's do it. Let's move ahead. This resolution needs to be passed, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington. Madam Speaker, I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Mrs. DeLauro, who is also the ranking Democratic member on Health and Human Services. The gentlelady from Connecticut is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman. I rise in opposition to this 14-day continuing resolution. The House majority is threatening to close down the government. This is brinkmanship. Their desire to engage in brinkmanship damages our economy and creates uncertainty for businesses and families. Make no mistake, the proposed budget cuts will cost jobs, 700,000 jobs by the end of 2012, according to economist Mark Zandi, who in fact was the chief economist for Senator John McCain in his presidential bid. Let me be clear. I am very supportive of the removal of earmarks in this resolution. They should be cut. We understand the need for deficit reduction. The question is, where do we start? Our first priority should be to go after waste and special interest spending. Forty billion dollars to the oil industry, which we are providing today. Forty billion dollars. What about the almost eight billion dollars to multinational corporations who take their jobs overseas? And yes, what about the eight billion dollars in agricultural subsidies. It is too bad that cutting these special interest subsidies is not the priority of the majority's resolution. Instead, this budget makes deep and reckless cuts in the areas that most impact middle class and working families. Of the $4 billion in immediate cuts put forward 
by this 14-day resolution. $1.4 billion comes out of education, health and human services, and out of training programs. And yes, almost a billion dollars, a quarter of the cuts, comes out of education. Education should be one of the last places we look to cut the budget, not the first. Yes, these cuts could be achieved by eliminating four programs proposed for termination by the President, as well as eliminating funding associated with earmarks last year. But these are not the President's proposals. While he would cut some education programs, he would then reinvest those savings in other education programs considered more effective. This resolution just wipes out the funding. This resolution severely cuts efforts to reduce illiteracy, which is a serious national problem for economic as well as human reasons. The largest program targeted, Striving Readers, represents a consolidation and reorganization of literacy programs that was just launched in 2010. Why would the Republican majority think it is responsible to strip away funding to improve literacy in this country before it even has a chance to work? I'm particularly concerned and disappointed by the elimination of Even Start. Even Start is about breaking the cycle of poverty and illiteracy by improving educational opportunities for families. I do not agree with the President's assessment that it should be terminated, and I do not support its elimination in this resolution. This is an effective and a critical program that should be allowed to continue. I am not the only one concerned by the consequences of this reckless budget. 300, 300 leading economists have signed a letter to the President noting how these spending cuts will diminish our economic competitiveness. Goldman Sachs reported to its investors that the Republican budget will slash economic growth by 2% of, 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 of our economic growth. That would send the unemployment numbers back over 10%. Americans want us to craft a budget for the remainder of the year that creates jobs, reduces the deficit, and strengthens the economy. Do we start with slashing special interest and waste, like the $40 billion that we are providing in subsidies to the oil companies? And last time any of us looked, they were doing pretty well. They don't need any subsidies. Or do we start by cutting the things that help the middle class, which help our businesses, and working families with children and with seniors? This resolution increases unemployment. It will hurt our economic recovery. And I urge my colleagues to oppose this reckless resolution. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady's time's expired. Did she have extra time? Gentlelady's time's expired. Okay. Gentleman from Kentucky. Yield two minutes, Madam Speaker, to the gentleman who is the chairman of the Agriculture Subcommittee on Appropriations. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Kingston. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. I thank the chairman for the time. And Madam Speaker, I want to make three very important points right off the bat. Number one, our debt is almost at 95 percent of the GDP. It's the highest debt we've ever had in history. Last year alone, the deficit was one and a half trillion dollars. We are borrowing 40 cents for every one dollar that we spend. Now, if you and I were doing that in our households, or a business was doing it, or anybody else, you would say, okay, we've got to change our spending habits. But somehow, there are those in Congress who think that we can continue to defy the laws of gravity. We have got to get our house in order. Number two, why are we here? We're here because the Democrats last year did not pass a budget, did not pass appropriation bills, and did not complete their work on fiscal year 2011. That's what we're doing. We are trying to clean up the mess that was left to us. And in doing that, we are mindful of our financial situation and trying to reduce some of the spending. Now, number three, let me say this. This bill was passed with an open rule. Indeed, I believe we had 127 
votes on different amendments. Democrats and Republicans offered a myriad of amendments. Now, for those who are complaining on the floor today that they don't like these cuts, why didn't they offer their amendments on the floor a couple of weeks ago? That would have been the way to do this. Now, the chairman and the speaker have committed to have open rules throughout this process this year, and so there will be a lot of opportunities to go after some of these programs. And some of the ones that are mentioned with, I think I will support those cuts. But I just want to emphasize that everyone has had a bite of this apple. And finally, let me just say this, Madam Speaker. The Zandi report comes from an economist, a political economist, we might say, who was the same person who told us the stimulus bill would work. The stimulus bill would keep us from going to 8% unemployment. We reached 10%. I don't think we need to listen to any more of his advice. Thank you. I, I yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. Well, I, I thank the chairman, and I just want to say that I don't, I don't think that Mr. Zandi has any more credibility. We've already spent $800 billion on his advice that the stimulus program would work, and it did not work. Oh. And is the gentleman aware that Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, now says that this, that H.R. 1 would have no harmful effect on the economy? I, I, I have heard that, and I understand there's something like 150 sure. other economists who signed a letter to that effect that uh, was led by a, a John Taylor who's an a economist as well. And that cutting spending and, and reducing the deficit will give confidence to the business community to hire people and put people to work. I thank time's the chairman. expired. Gentleman, time's expired. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield three minutes to the gentlelady from uh, Texas, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, one of our distinguished members. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for three minutes. Uh, I thank the speaker. Let me um, thank the uh, ranking member of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, let me thank uh, the chairperson. I sometimes uh, have a slip of tongue, Mr. Dix, and call you chairman, but I, I thank you uh, very much uh, for um, this opportunity. I want to uh, just try to give a procedural class here today. Uh, the procedural class is that this document uh, is a placeholder. Uh, I would hesitate to call it a fake document. But that is what it is. As I left my constituency, the last words I heard is, don't you all shut down the government. And I am glad that Mr. Dix worked hard to submit his amendment in the Rules Committee. It's unfortunate that the wise men and women didn't have a majority. Republicans would not yield uh, to a thoughtful amendment by Mr. Dix. But this is a two-week document. We know how old and what many of us have seen a two-week-old baby. That's what this is, a two-week document so we can do the right thing. It needs to be very clear that before we left in the 110th Congress, Democrats had already cut $41 billion. Now, many say we didn't have a budget. We had a budget, but we had no compromise, no reconciliation, no fairness, no concern about the American people. Now we've spent three months, March 1st, doing nothing, and not one bill creates a job. Goldman Sachs, I know that there's a critique on Goldman Sachs, but you can't discount the independent objective assessment of them saying that in the CR that was passed a week ago, 700 to 800,000 jobs will be lost. Mark Zandi was the economist and advisor to John McCain. I'm not sure what politics he has, but he is not in a political office today and he provides us with an independent assessment that the CR that we voted on, which the Senate would not agree to, would cost us 800,000 jobs. This document will go nowhere. Unfortunately, the $4 billion that is cut out of here and a, a litany of other unfortunate cuts is only temporary. I want to live to fight another day. We all want to be able to respond to the needs of this country in deficit reduction and a fair budget. But we could have had a clean CR, and we would have reasonably sat down and made right decisions. Most economists have said that cutting the government in the middle of a budget year is ineffective. The Fiscal Bipartisan Commission said project to 2012 and 2013. Don't cut 2011. 
it's important for the American people to know this is in the midst of your budget year. So Pell Grants for students who are in college right now who have already gotten uh, an amount rendered to them. May I? Three more seconds to finish. I thank the distinguished gentleman. Some students who are now mid-year operating on maybe a $1,000 grant for Pell Grant to finish out in May, what we're doing is cutting them in the midst. That's what was voted on a week ago. What we're doing now is to recognize that uh, people who govern are responsible for making sure the doors of this government stay open. I care about Homeland Security as a member of the Homeland Security Committee. I care about the DEA task force fighting drug cartels. I care about children getting education, health care, the environment. So let me just say this. We're doing this because we believe in the American people. But don't you for a moment think that this document is worth anything. We've got to get to business and fight for the American people and preserve education. That's what Democrats stand for, and that's what we'll fight for. I yield Time's back. Expired. Gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, I yield three minutes to the Chairman of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Appropriations, gentleman from uh, Alabama, Mr. Adderholt. Gentleman from Alabama is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair and uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for yielding this time to me. Uh, as it's been pointed out, uh, two weeks ago this chamber voted emphatically to cut spending and to right-size our government. This uh, CR that's before us today is a necessary stopgap that will keep the government operating until we can finalize an agreement on those spending cuts that was contained in H.R. 1. The Homeland Security sections of the CR before us today strikes the right balance between funding priority programs that are essential to our nation's security and at the same time keeping our discretionary spending in check. This CR cuts over $264 million in earmarks from the Department of Homeland Security's budget, while at the same time sustaining the current staffing levels of our frontline operating agencies like Border Patrol, CBP, ICE, and the Coast Guard, proof that we can cut spending and fund these functions of government that are truly vital. As, as I said two weeks ago on this floor, the Department of Homeland Security is not immune from physical discipline and no program or agency is beyond the belt tightening that our government so desperately needs. By implementing these cuts, we are not choosing between Homeland Security and physical responsibility. Both are serious national security concerns and issues and must be dealt with immediately. And through a series of prudent choices, this CR achieves both. Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, this CR is a reasonable first step in addressing our government's physical crisis. There is absolutely no reason why the President or our colleagues in the Senate cannot support these overdue spending cuts. The American people are demanding no less. I thank the uh, distinguished uh, Chairman of the Appropriations Committee for yielding this time, and I yield back the balance. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington. I yield myself uh, one minute. Gentlemen's recognized for one minute. You know, everybody, as I've said uh, here today, everyone is in favor of doing deficit reduction. We want to do it in a way that won't hurt the economy. And what I'm concerned about is that if we, if, if we have this large cut and then the states and local governments cut $125 billion at the same time, we'll have about $185 billion of cuts. And that is going to cause a, a, a decline in economic growth. I mean, it is basic economics. The way you get the deficit down is get people back to work. Get people jobs. Get them back to work. So you want to, when the economy is as fragile as it is, it's a question of timing. And what the commission members said is, don't do it in 11, do it in 12 and 13, and then deal with the entire budget, deal with the entitlements, deal with the, uh, uh, deal with the uh, taxes, do, do the whole thing, do the uh, budget agreement that we all know we have to do. And that's going to take bipartisanship. That's going to take both of us, the President and the Senate and the House. I yield myself at one additional minute. Challenge uh, recognized for one minute. Uh, have, are going to have to get together and work out an agreement and come out together and support it in order to get this through. This is what we did with uh, Bob Dole and, and Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. So, I mean, we can do this, but we have to we have, to have everything on the table. 
again, I worry about this two weeks uh, to get this done. I think that's a bit ambitious. And again, I want to point out to my colleagues that it was the Democratic House and Senate and President who passed the bill, the CR, that cut $41 billion from Obama's FY11 request. $41 billion. And uh, so I want to make sure you all don't forget that. The other side doesn't forget that. I'm going to try to continue to remind you of that fact. So we've, 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 we've been, you know, you know, pay me now or pay me later. We paid uh, in December, and, and now you guys have to work this thing out. And we want to help you a little bit on how to do it. Uh, I yield back. I reserve my time. Gentleman's time's expired. Gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, I yield three minutes to the Chairman of the Labor HHS Subcommittee on Appropriations, gentleman from Montana, Mr. Reberg. Gentleman from Montana is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rogers. Uh, Madam Chair, I rise to express my deep frustration with this extension. Here we go again, debating another continuing resolution. I'm starting to feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. In that movie, the main character wakes up every morning to relive the same day again and again. He never moves forward because he's stuck on Groundhog Day. Last year, Republicans in the House put the country on notice that we would try to reduce spending by $100 billion this year. The Senate knew, and the American people knew, and they gave us a substantial majority in the House. We worked responsibly and openly on a continuing resolution to meet that goal. After considering scores of amendments and engaging in long days of thoughtful debate, we succeeded. In response, the Senate Majority Leader summarily dismissed our good faith efforts and recessed the Senate for a week. Despite giving us an unprecedented three years of trillion dollar deficits, the majority leader dismissed our efforts to reduce spending less than 2% from the total fiscal 11 budget. In the interest of continuing our work on behalf of the American taxpayer and finding some common ground, Republicans are offering this two week extension, another continuing resolution made necessary only because the Democrat leadership refused to adopt a budget last year. It's like Groundhog Day all over again. During this short extension, we propose to save $4 billion, too much for Senator Reid. He suggests a freeze on spending for 30 days while he contemplates our proposal. The national debt will increase another $136 billion during that time. This is part of a big stall. Keep stalling. Keep implementing unaffordable health care entitlement programs. Keep threatening. Keep spending, all the while ignoring the will of the people. But the growing $14.5 trillion national debt is dragging our country into economic ruin and a looming health care law with $2.5 trillion in new spending when fully implemented is about to bury us. And make no mistake, I'm not happy that funding for the implementation of health care law continues in this continuing resolution. At some point, soon, before it's too late, the majority leader and the Democrat colleagues need to meaningfully address our spending problem. Unfortunately, all indications are that our good faith effort to find common ground with this two-week extension will not bring the Senate to the table to negotiate. The President and the Senate majority hold the balance of power in Washington, D.C., but they stand against the majority of Americans. I'll support this measure, but I've been pushed to my limit. Groundhog Day may have been an entertaining movie, but it shouldn't be the basis for a system of government. It's time for the Senate to get to work. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, Madam Speaker, how much time do I have remaining? The gentleman from Washington has 13 minutes remaining. The gentleman from Kentucky has 15 and a half minutes remaining. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I'll yield two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my friend for yielding. I hope that we are begin to, beginning to usher in in the next two weeks a season of compromise on this very important question before the country. And I hope and I'm confident that Chairman Rogers and Mr. Dix are capable of striking a very sound compromise for the people of our country. Here's where we are. When the fiscal year began on October 1st, uh, there were a series of resolutions that said let's live under the budget that spent what last year spent and we've lived under that budget until this time. That budget saves $41 billion below what the administration asked for last February. 
The majority, about 10 days ago, passed a bill that said it wants to spend $100 billion less uh, than what was proposed by the administration last February. Now, logical people would say that we're very well on the way to a sensible compromise. Uh, we're on track to save $41 billion below what was requested. The majority wishes to spend $100 billion less than that. I'm certain that talented legislators like the chairman, like Mr. Dix, uh, left to their own uh, devices and leadership, can find a way to have us strike a middle ground for the rest of the fiscal year. I'm hoping that this is the last one of these temporary extensions we have so that those who rely upon the continuing funding of government departments, vendors, employees, and institutions will be able to do so. I think it's fertile for a good compromise, and I certainly hope the House reaches it. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, I yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Austria. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I thank the chairman for yielding, and I rise today in support of this short-term continuing resolution, which must be passed this week to avoid a shutdown of many important programs and services. Our first priority today is job growth. That's why we're putting into place policies that will stop the runaway spending here in Washington and help bring more certainty to our financial and business markets to grow our economy and create long-term sustainable jobs. Last week, I had the opportunity to visit the largest single-site employer in the state of Ohio, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And I was told that if the government shuts down, that thousands of people may be asked not to come to work. And if we don't pass this short-term CR, this is one place that would surely suffer from a shutdown, which is responsible for numerous def national defense programs that depend on continued funding. Without funding, programs like this across the country will not get off the ground in a timely manner, may incur chromatic delays and costs, jeopardize the national defense programs they support, and put thousands of jobs, including small businesses, on the line. We must do the responsible thing and pass the short-term resolution, which will buy us time to find a long-term solution to our budget crisis. Madam Speaker, people across America, and especially in Ohio, have spoken very clearly that Washington needs to cut spending. Nobody said these cuts were going to be easy, but they're absolutely essential to help our, put our country back on a fiscally sustainable path that will create jobs and strengthen our economy for future generations. With the leadership of Chairman Rogers, this House has already passed a CR that helped protect national defense, but in addition to that, made more than $100 billion in cuts. When we pass the short-term CR, we will have passed another $4 billion in cuts. It's time for the Senate to do their job and pass a CR, and I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this short-term CR and show that we're listening to the American people by passing a CR that includes uh, substantial cuts and will put us on a fiscally sustainable path forward. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield uh, one minute to the. Are you, you want to go? Yeah. I want. I yield one minute to the distinguished Democratic leader and former Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The minority leader is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank him. Uh, for yielding time and for presenting the Dix substitute, which was not allowed to come to the floor, but nonetheless, I salute him for his leadership in that regard. Uh, Madam Speaker, members of Congress agree, I think, on two things today, uh, that we must move this process forward that government, so that government does not shut down, and that we must reduce the deficit. As we do that, we must create jobs and strengthen the middle class. That is some place where we may have some separation uh, because we have, as the distinguished uh, ranking member Mr. Dix has said earlier, in December of 2010, congressional Democrats and the President of the United States cut spending by $41 billion. $41 billion. On that day in December, only one Republican voted for those cuts. Only one. February, two months later, Republicans passed a spending bill that does not create jobs,
but in fact has been said to destroy 700,000 jobs. That's approximately 100,000 jobs a week since we passed our cut it bill. February 2011, Republicans passed the same spending bill that reduces U.S. economic growth by one and a half to two percent. Now, some have questioned, is it really as much as 400,000, 700,000 jobs? Is it really as much as one and a half to two percent? But no one questions whether there will be job loss or whether there will be uh, a, a slowing down of our economic growth among serious economists. We are going in the wrong direction. How fast may be the question, but we are going in the wrong direction. That is why it's very important for us to proceed with great care and great caution here, because again, we have the opportunity to create jobs, to strengthen the middle class, and to do so in a way that is fiscally sound. When I hear our colleagues talk about the deficit and the immorality of a big deficit, and I completely agree. We owe it to our children and our grandchildren not to leave them a debt. But all this talk about deficit is one we have, as Democrats, taken the lead on for decades. Do you remember, because many of you were here at the time, that when President Clinton became president, he inherited an enormous debt. He instituted pay-as-you-go. We had an economic agreement that was passed in the Congress, and the deficit began to reduce to a pass of $5.6 trillion in surplus. Another President Bush took office, pay-as-you-go went out the window, and again, the turnaround into growing deficits. So for all of this talk about the immorality of deficits, where were you when those deficits were instituted in the late 80s? Some of you were here. In the 2000s, many of you were here. And again, we have to take our country on a path of deficit reduction. Many of you were here when the tax cuts for the high end were implemented, creating no jobs except increasing our deficit, sending the bill to our children, and the credit to the Chinese government. How about when we did the prescription drug bill, giving away the store to the pharmaceutical industry and the price tag to our children by increasing the deficit. How about two wars, unpaid for wars? God knows we will do anything to protect and defend our people. And I would hope that everybody subscribe to that. Why would we have tax cuts for people at the highest end? Why wouldn't they pay their fair share of protecting the American people and American interest and their interest wherever they may exist in the world. And so we had, in the eight years of President Bush's administration, a complete reversal, an $11 trillion swing of $5.6 trillion in surplus to nearly $5 trillion in debt. And now people are saying debts are the national debt. It's an immorality to have these deficits. We thoroughly agree. And that's why, once again, we must take us our country down a path of deficit reduction, but to do so in a way that is job creating and strengthening of the middle class. As I said, December 2010, Democrats cut $41 billion in spending. Only one Republican voted for that. February 2011, Republicans passed a spending bill that could destroy 700,000 jobs and reduce slow down our GDP, our, our um, gross uh, uh, domestic product by 1.5 to 2 percent. I know if you want to say it's going to be less than that, it's going to slow down less than that, it's still going in the wrong direction. Mr. Dix, I commented on his uh, proposal because in the bill that we have before us, we have a situation where the Republicans have stripped the bill of important initiatives for the education of our children. In fact, President Obama 
made some of those cuts too. But he didn't do it in a way that hurt the children. What we debate today undermines our future by stripping support for some pressing educational challenges without redirecting those critical resources to meet the educational needs of our children. What Mr. Dix proposed would have reversed that. He would uh, have eliminated those educational programs in a way, as did the President, in the context of a comprehensive budget that also redirected funds to other initiatives addressing these needs. If we do not, as a Congress, understand that education is essential, is key to all of our success, key to all of our success, uh, then, I, fr I, frankly, the American people are way ahead of us on that. That's why when we debated the bill before the break, to see a, two, a quarter of a million children thrown off of Head Start and many teachers fired alongside that. That's not, a, is, is that a smart, is that a smart cut? Sure, we have to tighten our belt, but let's do it again in a very smart way. I, I just want to know where everybody was in the days when this deficit grew, in the eight years of the Bush administration. That's why we are in the situation we are today. That's why we must, again, make some very difficult decisions. So that what is before us today is a short term, let's just uh, keep the government open two weeks, so we use that time to do the right thing, to use that time to have a reality check, a reality check on how we got these deficits in the first place and how tax cuts at the highest end that do not create jobs but increase the deficit are not the appropriate path to deficit reduction. How cutting education and therefore the innovation that goes with it and the strength of our children and our economy is affected is not the way to do it. Many people in here have met much experience on the way to do it and they sit on both sides of the aisle. So let's get through this today recognizing the challenge that we have, understanding that this bill before us is not a good one, but it's not final, and recognizing that when we come together, we meet the three criteria. Three criteria. Does it create jobs? Does it strengthen the middle class? Does it reduce the deficit? Because all of those who say that it's immoral for us to grow the deficit and pass those bills on to our children and grandchildren are right. I just don't want them to ignore the way the fact that we got here that path again with a sanctimonious attitude that it is a morality for us to do exactly the same thing again, ignoring again the tremendous, tremendous suffering of the American people and their need for jobs ignoring the aspirations of our children and their need uh, for education by making the cuts that are in here without rechanneling them to a better place. This is as serious a debate that we can have in the Congress of the United States because it affects our children and their future, because the deficits have gotten so far out of hand. I'm very proud of the fact that 30 years ago, well, 1982, when, well, 20, 29 years ago, when Democrats gathered in Philadelphia for a midterm conference, pay as you go was placed on the agenda, passed as a resolution, became part of the Democratic platform. Fiscal responsibility is a part of who we are. Our Blue Dog Coalition, is that you, Mr. Lewis? Our Blue Dog Coalition, has had this as their mantra. Pay as you go. Do not add to the deficit. If we all share that view, we should all be able to come together because the numbers will add up or they will not add up. And the bill, for sure, will be sent to our children and our grandchildren. Some of you have children. Some of you have cho children and grandchildren. Would you ever dream of sending them a bill for a personal expense. 
if you were to leave them anything? Would you leave them a bill? We cannot leave the children of America with any bills for any fiscal deficit either. It wouldn't be the right thing to do. But in order for us to do the right thing, it is time for a serious reality check. And that's the opportunity Mr. Dix was giving us today. Uh, the Rules Committee rejected that. I hope that in the weeks ahead, depending on what happens here today, let's just move on with it so we can spend whatever time it takes to do it right. Nothing less is at stake than the economic security of our country, the well-being of our children, the well-being of our children, and the confidence that the American people have in what we are sent here to do for them. With that, Mr. Madam Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The Minority Leader yields back the balance of her time. The gentleman from Kentucky. Madam Speaker, I yield myself one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. To point out to the body that over the last two years, the Congress went on a spending spree and increased spending by 84 percent in just two years. You ran the deficit up, the annual deficit, now two in a row, trillion dollar plus deficits per year, record breaking. We've never had that before. You've ran the debt up to where now we're bouncing against the ceiling and the Congress will be called upon to increase the debt ceiling. There were no appropriations bills passed last year at all. Thus, that's why we're here today. So let's talk about the spending spree that we're trying to slow down and stop, Madam Speaker, with this bill. I yield back that time and yield two minute, three minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, a uh, member of our committee, Mr. Graves. Just recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. And I appreciate the chairman for clarifying some things that we just heard because I was at a loss thinking I was going to need much more than three minutes to uh, uh, you know, rewrite some of what we just heard there and, and uh, correct the historical account of the last several years. You know, but we've heard the lamenting and wailing today from the other side of the aisle. And, and it's amazing to hear about why are we here? You know, why are we in this position today? We're hearing government shut down from the Democrats. You're not hearing that from the Republicans. You're hearing, no, we've got to cut spending and reduce the size of government. But we hear we're at the brink. We're about to shut down government. And we have to wonder, why are we here? Well, the chairman brought it up so eloquently there just a minute ago. When they were in the leadership last year, and it wasn't that long ago, one year ago, they had the opportunity. They had the opportunity to pass their own budget. They didn't do it. So instead, they, they passed a CR. CR went for about four or five weeks. Wasn't enough. Let's do another one because, again, they could not pass a budget. Passed another CR for two more weeks. Again, that wasn't quite enough. So let's go three days because we don't know how to pass a budget nor have an appropriations meeting. And then, yet again, let's pass another one for just over two months. That is why we are here today. That is why the Republicans are stepping up and leading. That is why the Republicans passed a CR a few weeks ago, cutting $100 billion. But yet again, the Democrats, they do not want to step up and lead at this time in our nation. So here we are again, the chairman of appropriations, and the Republicans have stepped up and said it's time to lead. So $2 billion a week in cuts, yes, that's what we're proposing. Should it be more? Sure, it should be more. To those who said we were cutting the wrong programs, I assure you, you'll have your chance to cut those programs because, again, we will be cutting more. So this measure, hopefully it'll pass both chambers, will avert the government shutdown, and the question is then, what happens next? The American people want to know that. Well, I want the American people to know this, that there are more spending cuts on the way. Now, some of my colleagues on the other side, they'll say, you know what, we don't need to cut spending. In fact, we've heard that. We've heard that they want to freeze spending instead, which is akin to tying a brick to the accelerator of this vehicle that's going off the cliff when we need to take our foot off that accelerator. Again, it's the status quo is what we hear from the other side. We heard a minute ago from the leader of the Democrats, former speaker, and her quote was, they took the lead in deficits. Oh, is she so right? 
In fact, they have led three straight years of deficit spending, consecutive years, trillion dollar deficits, and now $14 trillion debt. What leadership that is. The status quo is unacceptable. The American people deserve so much more. So today, let's stop that threat of the government shutdown and let's save the taxpayers $4 billion. Let's come back, let's save them billions upon billions more. But let's get ready because deeper spending cuts are necessary. And as we saw from that government accounting report, duplicative programs exist. Madam Speaker, it's time to eliminate some of those programs, continue eliminating portions of this government, and get this fiscal house back on track. Thank you. Gentlemen, time's expired. The gentleman from Washington.